Okay, ladies, we're going to be in Acts chapter 24 today, and we are going to have the movie that we didn't have last week. It was a long chapter last week, so we're going to get caught up this week. We're going to watch chapter 23 and 24, and the chapter that we're studying today is just such a blessing because it's going to motivate each of us in this new year. So if I can get Dory back there to turn those off for us, and we'll go ahead and watch it. Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, You dare to insult God's high priest. Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he had said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. The next morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, oh, the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked him, what is it? Do you want to tell me? He said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man and cautioned him don't tell anyone that you've reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias to His Excellency Governor Felix, greetings. 
This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day, they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix. We acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias the commander comes, he said, I will decide your case. <laughs> he 
He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. OK, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. I thank you for all the gals that are here. And Lord, we just ask you that you would come, you would send your Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts, that, Lord Jesus, we would be able to glean from your word this morning to encourage our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 24 is where we're going to be picking up. You had that little recap there of what had happened to Paul, how the Lord had made a way from him to be able to go down and be able to go and to um, appear before Felix, and yet the Lord made sure that he got there safely and uh, sent 470 men with him, either on horseback or um, soldiers with um, spears. He was protected, and we talked about how we are protected in the midst of our enemies. And that's what today's gonna be talking about too. And chapter 24, verse one, it says, after five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tateris and gave evidence to the governor against Paul. His enemies are unrelenting. And we need to remember that in the spiritual realm that your enemy is unrelenting also. He has no power over you. The evil world, the evil one has no power over you, but he is relentless in trying to discourage you. And in this world now, when we are dealing with so many uh, changes happening and with a pandemic, that discouragement can come at pretty much any time in any place. And he's relentless many times in your lives. And the Bible wants us to be clear about that, that just because you're in the center of God's will does not mean that you do not have an active enemy. Paul, even though he is sent to prison and a house arrest, he is exactly where God wants him to be. And here we see, it says here, they came down relentlessly following him down to Caesarea where they're gonna go ahead and have court against him and bring their strong reasonings while he, why he should be in trouble, in jail, or persecuted. Verse two, and when he was called upon, Tatillus began this accusation saying, see that you, we brought you here with, we enjoy great peace since you've been here, Felix, and prosperity, and being brought with you to this nation and foresight. They are complimenting him. The Jews have hired an orator, somebody that was like a lawyer to go on their behalf to speak very clearly and soundly. Because before Felix, they're all looking like a bunch of mad women or mad men, pulling them apart. Remember, we talked about the Sadducees, the Pharisees. So they decided if they're gonna make their point, to this governor, they're gonna have to look like they are prepared and professional. So they went ahead and hired a lawyer to speak for them to destroy Paul. The word Tertullius actually means third. And I wonder if this is where we got the idea of the third party involved. Isn't that interesting? You know how we'll have a mediator go before people many times trying to bring the two together. A third party comes in. And he was there, paid by the Jews, to destroy Paul. Verse 3, we accept always in all places you are most noble, Felix, and we accept you with all thankfulness. Flattery, the mere word flattery, what it, ex it means is excessive, insecure praise given to further your own interest. Oh, be careful of flattery. 
you know? Um, be careful of the ones that are like that, the politicians that will go up and kiss the babies and then say it's okay to have abortions. Oh, be careful of the flattering mouths that we have around us, even in today's world. And this was how this man was going about it. He was going to build him up. Well, if there's some of you in here that I know you own businesses, and you know that they say it's, it's best not just to go to the person and say, hey, you're slacking, I don't like the way you're doing this, but the best thing you can do when you have an employee is point out all the good they do, they're prompt, they're on time, you appreciate you know, their truthfulness, and I have a couple of things against you now, and then you go into how they can improve on their job. Well, they are going to lay it on thick to Felix, the governor. They want him to know that they think he's great, and they're flattering him. Most noble Felix. This guy, Felix, was raised a slave, and through his cunning and through his political personality, he got his freedom when he was quite young. And then he goes on to be somebody that can go ahead and just work a room. He's just good at this. And now he's a judge. And he's a governor. And so here he has these skills, but he's not noble. He's not kind. He's not fair. He is actually brutal, and he's immoral. And um, he had actually even ordered that a thousand Jews be killed. And here they come to him trying to plead their cause and complimenting him. And this is what they say. Verse 4. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I won't go on. I'd just get to the point after we've complimented you and told you how wonderful you are and how we're thankful for you. And to this evil man, they go on and say, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. And keep in mind, this is a lawyer speaking to them. We have found this man a plague. Stop right there. A plague. They're calling him a plague. I don't know. That's just ridiculous. You know, what they're saying is he is actually a walking pestilence. Everywhere he goes is trouble and he is a disease and people um, are in chaos and turmoil. It says here, we found this man to be a plague the creator of dissension amongst all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Okay, he is making a point here. He is laying down his his outline. He's got it there. But first of all, let's look at this. He's He's a walking pestilence. He is the creator of dissension amongst all the Jews. And I like what David Gusick said. He goes, can't you just imagine this playing out in your mind? And here's Paul beat up over here. Here is this lawyer speaking for the Jews. And he said, he's a, discon- he's a discontention for all of the Jews. He upsets all of the Jews. Can you imagine Paul looking up maybe and looking over and going, I do? I upset everybody? That's my whole goal. That's what I've been doing. I've been trying to tell my family, the Jews, that Jesus is alive. Maybe there was just a spark of happiness when he looked up and went, wow, you're exaggerating, but thank you. I'll take that badge. And it says here, amongst all the Jews of the world, and he's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. You know, they didn't expect anything good to come out of Nazareth. They don't, the Nazarene people were always um, embracing something. A lot of the false prophets would go through Nazareth. And so he's just going, he's one of the sect. He's one of these many people that rise up, think there's something, and he's nothing. Paul is a danger because he's an influencer. Now, this morning, that might be you. You may be an influencer. In fact, all of you in this room have more influence on people than you ever dreamed that you are just friends with or you meet in general out in the public. How do you know if you're an influencer? I got a couple things you might want to jot down. First of all, you have the power to affect others. Do you affect others when you talk with them? Do you have that in them that they notice this about you, that, that they... They, you, you kind of sway what they do. Number two, to be an influencer, you ha- must have a relationship with the audience. 
There, when, even on uh, media now, they say if you know you have somebody out there, these, they, they, there's actually these people they um, hire in the media. They're called the influencers because they have a lot of followers on their Facebook page and on their Instagrams and all these other things that people are doing. And they're called influencers because they have an audience of people that listen to him. And also an influencer is an expertise in a specific topic. They are an influencer and they know a lot about a subject and that's why they're bringing it forth. And so this is what they're calling Apostle Paul. He is an influencer. He has power over people. He says things. He has an audience that's about him. And he is an expertise in what he is saying to these people, even though we hate him and we don't agree with it. Profane is what they're going to be saying here next in verse 6. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted him to be judged according to our law. He is horrible. Acts, right over here. You don't have to turn with me. I'll just read it to you. Acts chapter 21, 21 verses 27 and 28. It says here, now on the seventh day, they were almost ended from the Jews in in Asia, seeing in a temple, he stirred up the whole crowd, then they laid hands on him. Men of Israel, crying out, men of Israel, this man who teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law of this place, furthermore, he has even brought Greeks into the temple. This is what they're accusing him of. This is what they're saying about him in court. And it says here, verse 28, they had previously seen Teropolis and Ephesian with Paul in the city, whom they supposed Paul brought to the temple. Well, Paul wouldn't have done that. Paul was trying to reach the Jews. He wasn't trying to alienate them. He was trying to say, I was raised Jewish. I know of who I listened to. I sat underneath Gamaliel. He was the the whole professor of what we believe in. And he said, "I, I would never have done that. I know how they would have reacted. I'm trying to win them, not have them come against me. And they supposed, because he was talking to a Greek outside of the temple, that he was going to bring them in. And we have to be so careful that we get the right facts when we're in a situation and that we we don't just take a side or we look at something and go, oh, I'm sure that's how it is. But that we look at it and go, you know, like these people, they just supposed he was going to do that. And Paul was innocent. Verse 8, commanding his accusers to come to you. Now you examine him him yourself that you will see for certain of all the things I'm saying about you. See for yourself what this evil man is. And yet they were the ones dragging him into court. They were the ones beating him up. They were the ones that were being horrible to him, rude to him. They were the ones that wanted him dead. And yet they're picking out and saying Paul is doing everything they are. You know, there's an old saying, it says your sin looks worse on someone else than it does on you. Isn't that true? The very thing lots of times that you're accusing somebody of, you are the one guilty of that very thing. But if we see someone else doing it, we're like, oh my gosh, that's just horrible. But then maybe you do exactly the same thing. And Jesus talks about this Jesus talks to this in Matthew chapter 7. Let me just read it to you for just a minute. Judge not, lest you won't be judged. This is Jesus talking. For what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure that you measure, it will be back, used back at you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider the plank in your own? Or how is it that you can say to your brother, let me remove that speck from your eye and look, there's a plank in your own eye. Hypocrites, first remove the plank out of your own eye. Worry about yourself first. More about worrying about someone else's problems that they're doing or what God hasn't convicted them of or what, you know. Worry more about yourself is what the Bible is saying here. Then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck in your brother's eye. Now, there's two things here that's interesting. 
He's saying, remove the plank from your own eye. Then, then you're going to be able to see clearly what your sister is struggling with. Go before the Lord first and say, Lord, clean me, cleanse me. Let me be a a clean vessel for you to use today. You know, I never stand up here without repenting first. I want you to know that. That I take inventory in my life. Gerald takes inventory in his life. BJ takes inventory in his life. Riley, Blaine, all of the ones that we have speaking. Gina never gets up and speaks before she takes inventory here first. Because we don't want to be hypocrites. We don't want to stand up and act like we've got it all together when we've got a plank sticking out of our eye. And so we ask the Lord to cleanse. And then what does it say? Then you can see clearly. Well, she's really not rude. She's struggling with this. Or, you know, this is really why she's acting out this way. This is what's happening in her life. It doesn't say, then leave them alone. It says, then you can help them. But first clean up yourself. And I love that about Jesus. And that's what's happening here to Paul. They are accusing Paul of every single thing that they did. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, then. And have that word then underlined. That you don't walk away from him, that you don't stop caring about them. But then you can see clearly what's going on with them. They supposed that Paul was bringing a Greek into the temple. They weren't seeing clearly. They had planks. They probably had planks all over their eyes coming out, just shoots of trees coming right out of their eyes everywhere, and then go up and say, Paul, could you be talking to a Greek and bring him into the temple? And it says here, remove that first out of your own life. Then you can see clearly what's going on in your sister's life. Clean it up first here. And then go, oh, thank you, Lord. Let me help her. Let me see what she's going through. In verse um, 6, it says, oh, we're going to stop right there. See clearly the speck in your own sister's eyes. Back here in Acts, we're going to continue on. Examining these accusers, we brought him to you. And the Jews assessed it, and the maintenance of all these things were so. They're going, yes. They're standing over there in judgment to Paul. See for yourself the evil this person has done. See for yourself. And then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered. Paul's just waiting. And you know... I love how we've talked about how Paul just has the zingers, right? People attack him. He comes back with one-liners that are just like, whoa, that hurt. (laughs) Whoa, am I convicted. Paul is led by the Holy Spirit. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is the one that goes before Paul. And the Holy Spirit's the one that goes before us to help us in our lives, Because nothing that is formed against you, the Bible says, will prosper. It may look like it's gaining ground, but it's not going to prosper. God has said that. And here Paul is going to have to stand up and say his defense. And there's two words in here that should not go together. And let me show you what they are. Paul the governor nodded him to speak. And this is what he says. Insomuch as I've known you've been a governor for many years and a judge of this nation, I do therefore cheerfully answer myself. Stop. First of all, we see no flattery coming from Paul. Because Paul is going to tell the truth. Paul is going to stand there, look at him, knowing he just killed a thousand Jews, and not try to sway him and flatter him as he gets up to speak. He, have you ever just had a hard time thinking of something good to say about somebody? Seriously. I mean, ha, no, not you, but me. I mean, right? You just have a hard time going, but they smell good. <laughs> right? I mean, you just have a hard time. Paul's looking at this, this judge that was evil, and he was mean, and he was brutal, and he was cruel, and he killed Jews all the time, thought nothing of it. And he said, I see, I perceive that you've been a judge here for many years. 
He speaks truth. No flattery. Truth is enough. And then he says, because of that, I do more cheerfully answer for myself. In the Hebrew, cheerfully is glad. And so here he says, I'm going to answer for myself. I gladly will defend myself. How can you gladly defend yourself? Gladly and defend can't go together, can they? I mean, think of that. When you're defending yourself, you're frantically defending yourself, or you're purposely defending yourself, or you know, you're skillfully defending yourself. You're not gladly defending yourself unless you have an encounter with Jesus. Because gladly and defending cannot go together. It's supernatural. Just this verse here is supernatural. That he can look at him and say, you've been a judge for years, years and years, and now I stand before you, killer of the Jews, gladfully to defend myself. Only Jesus can give you that kind of defense. They don't go together. You have been a judge many years. You are evil, and I gladly defend myself. Right there, it speaks of the power of the Holy Spirit living in his life. How could he defend himself? How could he be glad about standing there, getting physically and mentally beat up by these people, being on trial? How can he be glad about it? Because just in a verse over here in 23... Verse 11, but then following night, the Lord stood by Paul and he said of him, be of good cheer, be courageous is what it says in the Hebrew, for you have testified of me in Jerusalem, you will also go to Rome. How can he be gladly defending himself? Because Jesus stands with him. And when you have Jesus standing with you, which you all do this morning, that overrides fear. When Jesus is standing with you in court or at work or in a, facing an illness, whatever it is, when Jesus is standing with you, it will give you that comfort to overcome. No matter what happens, I gladly defend myself because he's standing right next to me. I love that he remembered he's not in there alone. Be of good cheer. Be courageous. God will give you peace in the storm. I come to Sunday night services, and if you haven't been coming to them, they are amazing, okay? The worship, the teaching. But what's amazing, they just sang a new song, and we're going to be singing it eventually. Dylan and the worship team always do such a great job of bringing in great worship songs. And the, the team, just they are just so anointed, all of them up here that lead us in worship. Do you know why they, they're so anointed? Is they pray and they ask God to move through them. And Paul, here he is in the midst of all this, standing in peace in the storm. And Sunday night we sang about a song, You Give Me Peace in the Storm, that Everything else around us is chaotic. Everything else around us makes no sense. But I will have peace in the pandemic. I will have peace in the politics that's happening in our land. I will have peace because, Lord, you gladly defend me and stand with me. And so here we're going to read on, and it says here, um, verse 11, because you assume that... Um, you know, is what he's saying here, Paul's going, you know this just happened to me 12 days ago, and now they're still here bothering me. Do you know how old the high priest Ananias is at this time causing Paul all these problems? 80 years old. It's like, get a life. I look at some people that are in the politics in our world today, and I go, go home and knit. Just stop the madness, okay? Did I say that? Okay, scratch that. Just kidding. You can go out. 
But he's saying here, he goes, it's been 12 days since I've been dragged over here. And now five days later, I mean, here it is. I've been here five days, seven days later. Here they are. Five days later, here they are following me, causing me trouble. And he's looking at him going, you know, at a certain time of this, I came to you. In verse 11, because they may ascertain that there is no more than 12 days since I went up to to Jerusalem to worship. He goes, 12 days ago, I was up in the mountain, up the mountaintop, not the mountaintop, but the temple top, and I was going to worship. And you know what? Paul was telling them I was headed to church without any malice. I wasn't bringing Greeks in, and these people attacked me. But something I think that we need to notice about this verse is what it says in Hebrews, verses 23 to 25. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful to us. Now remember that. He is a faithful God. He will not leave you in this circumstance. He is faithful. And when the time is right, it will be removed. But he's faithful in the trouble. He's faithful in the disappointment this morning and in the circumstance And it says here, let us consider one another who is weak in order to stir up those with good works. For not forsaking of ourselves for assembling together as a manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Paul was going to church. You need to be coming to church. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together, even if the government threatens to shut you down like they're doing to Mike McClure in San Jose, Calvary Chapel. It's written in the Word of God that he wants us to come together. We can social distance. We can be careful. But you know what? As you see the day approaching, what's the day? That word there, day, is capitalized. The day is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. As you see it getting closer, come to church more is what this Bible verse is saying. We need each other. We need to be prayed up. We need to know that we're not in it alone. And so here, Paul's saying, I was in church. And they are attacking me here as I'm coming up to the temple. In verse 13, he says, Nor can they prove any of the things that they're accusing me of. But this I will confess to you according to the way which they call the sect. I was worshiping the God of my fathers, believing these things as is written in the laws of the prophets. He's going, I believed. There's no proof in what they're saying here. And Paul gets to tell his testimony. When you hear how the Lord works, it's so fun. Um, I was listening to this song, and we've been talking about testimony. You know, you're a walking testimony for the Lord. No one can argue with your testimony. How many of you have been giving your testimony more in the last month than you had the before? Raise your hand. Just little things. Hands are up everywhere. You're giving out what God did to you. Well, Paul is here again giving his testimony. Over and over again, we see Paul doing this. And so he's talking here, and he goes, they're calling me the sect. He goes, no, I'm from what they call the way, and I'm presenting Jesus Christ. I present about life after death. And so this is what these Jews are hating about me. He's starting to explain his ministry and explain his testimony and who he is before Felix. God's going to do some amazing things in these next couple of verses, so just hang on. But he says here in verse 18, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. He's going, they say the same thing. This being so, I myself always strive to have a good conscience towards God and men. And he's saying here, I have faith in God to Felix. And I do believe in the resurrection. And he's going to go on to say that's why it makes him so mad because he's talking about everyone can get saved. There is no special just one person, one race that come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. But look what he says out loud. I have hope 
in God. Can we do that three times all together? I have hope in God. I have hope in God. I have hope in God. And no matter what is going to happen in the future. He boldly stands up and he says, I have hope in God. And then in verse 17, now after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation. He's saying, I have done good to the people. There were people in the church, the churches that didn't have any money. I have come forward. I have been teaching that there is a resurrection. And they found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob or trump. He goes, when they went looking for me, I was in the temple. There wasn't a mob about me. I was minding my own business. I was doing what I was called to do. And he said, I strive always to have a good conscience. How do you get a good conscience? It's really easy. You pray. You pray. You want a good conscience this morning? Pray. You tell the Lord, Lord, forgive me of what I've done. Forgive me of what I said. Forgive me of my attitude. You know, you can never learn enough about Jesus. Gerald and I are going to be doing a, a couples retreat in Texas soon. And do you know what else I want to tell you? You can never learn enough about your spouse. Learn something new about him all the time. Learn something new that you didn't see before, a twinkle in his eyes you didn't notice before, the way he stands before. Notice something new about your husband. Notice something new about your children. Always be learning about the people that are in your life and never assuming, never supposing but always learning. We are to be constantly learning and basking in the presence of the Lord till the day we die. I'm always learning something new about what the Lord can do. I'm always amazed at how he turns the situation around or answers a prayer for somebody. I've shared this before, but I'm going to share it again because it's such a great idea, and I told it to my grandchildren. Maybe you'll want to tell it to your children or your grandchildren. Um, but there's a girl in our Bible college, and she has something that she does a lot. And when she prays, she puts her prayer requests on the inside of her door, okay? And so she writes, you know, all these things out. And so she said lots of times her, the inside of her door is just full of little post notes. And as the Lord answers the prayer, she puts the post note on the outside of the door. So she's always remembered as she goes inside her bedroom, God answers prayer. And when she's in her bedroom, she sees the needs. Isn't that fantastic? That's what we need to be doing. I told that to my grandchildren. And my two little granddaughters, they're, Laura's almost 10 and Ella's 10. And they both go, we're going to do that. And I said, you know, that would be such a blessing to your mom and dad to see when you prayed for something that it's moved to the front of the door. That everyone's going to rejoice in that. This is what Paul is constantly learning about what the Lord can do and what God's done. And it says here, he continues on, in the midst of the Jews from Asia, they found me being purified in the temple, neither with a mob causing any trouble. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me before now. Paul's going, this just happened days ago. I have been around a long time in Jerusalem. Why are they doing this now? It's only to cause me problems. Or else, why are they here themselves if they found any wrongdoing in me? Therefore, I stand before the council. He goes, where is their proof of what they're saying to me? They had no proof. They were merely wanting to kill Paul because of his words. Just words. He's done nothing wrong, but just words. Unless for this one statement, which I cried out concerning amongst them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I'm being judged by you all this day. He said, the only thing I can get really, that I can really see where they got upset with me was this one statement where I said, you're all going to be judged? 
God's going to judge you in the afterlife. You ever spoke truth to somebody and it hurts and they don't like it? Maybe you spoke truth to somebody and you text them. No answer. Check your phone. No answer. Truth. He said maybe it was this one statement they didn't like. Paul saying, I just told them there's going to be a judgment. Well, they're self-righteous. And they think that they don't have anyone above them. And they hated that about him. Unless for this one statement, I cried out, standing amongst them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged now with you on this day. And when Felix heard it, having been more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when, the, when Lystra comes, the commander comes down, I will make a decision on your case. Paul is looking at him. He's heard about the way, because we're going to read that he's married, Felix is married to a Jew. We're going to be reading a lot. He's heard about it. He's been around a long time. He's been a slave. And he's listening to Paul, and he said, I'll tell you what. You know, they got mad when you start talking about heaven and hell, and I can see your point, but I'm not going to judge you now. I'm going to postpone this. I am going to have the act of avoidance. I am going to delay. Why is he postponing it? Because he doesn't want to deal with it. Today, we are procrastinators. We have undone projects. We have undone relationships. We have undone beds. We have undone dishes. We have cars that need washed. We, have, we, we are procrastinators. I was one of the worst, I think. Gerald's worked on me quite a bit, but... Um, I used to procrastinate putting gas in my car. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. But when I was in Idaho, you would never see me or meet me with more than a half a tank. And I would never, never get more gas until I had five miles to go. <laughs> I like to live on the edge. I don't know what my problem was. And one of the things that Gerald, when he first came up and started seeing me, um, and my husband had passed away, and I'd go out and get him at the airport, and he would stay out at the Calvary house. We had a place out there. And um, the first thing he did, he would get in my car, and he'd pull into a gas station, and he'd fill my tank, okay? Because I think he thought it was a fluke. And then he'd come visit me again, and then it'd be an empty tank. And he goes... Do you always drive on empty? And I said, constantly. I don't know why I do that. I'm better now, but I'm not great at it. You know, but I, it was just something I would do. I procrastinated it. I don't know what my problem was. You know, I just felt better giving the, the gas uh, people $10. I did 20 I don't know. But I procrastinated. And you know what? It can become a habit. In your life today, you could be postponing something that's pretty important that you choose not to do. And why do you do it? Well, I'm going to give you some reasons why you procrastinate. Okay? So, but first of all, before I do, I want you to know that there was a person that capitalized on procrastination and on postponing, and it's Nike shoes. And what did they say? Just Just do it. This is why you procrastinate. Number one, you're afraid of failing, so you'll put that off. You're just afraid of it. You avoid starting, or you can avoid starting again. Some of you started and stopped. You need self-control 
to avoid procrastination. Self-control receives support from motivation. Self-control receives support from motivation. But your enemy of procrastination that wants you not to rise above that is anxiety. And it has a crippling effect on motivation. When you're worried, you have anxiety, you're upset, this affects your motivation, which, <laughs> which affects all of these different things in your life. And it causes you to put it off. Self-control and motivation are what you need to avoid procrastination. The good news of this is it's not a mental illness. <laughs> I was studying this. Why do we postpone? Why do we procrastinate? It's because of self-will. Self-control. If you controlled yourself, you'd finish the project. Right? You'd march yourself right in there and just do it. But procrastination, it works at your self-control. It works at all of this stuff. And then you motivate. It doesn't make you motivated. And then you end up doing nothing. It cripples you. It, why do you procrastinate more? Abstract goals. Abstract goals. And this is perfect. The reward is too far into the future. Do you think about that? I would have taken care of that, but yeah, I got time to work on that. The reward of it is too far into the future. You have a disconnect from your future self. When you procrastinate, you're, you're saying that's not going to happen. Okay, I'm disconnecting from that material that's sitting there screaming at me to make me a dress, all right? You disconnect from your person. You're blinded to the projects, and you even may start a new one. It's a feeling that comes from being overwhelmed. When you procrastinate, it looks so big. And the more you procrastinate, the bigger it gets, and it's a looming um, it's a looming darkness, okay? Feeling overwhelmed. You procrastinate because you worry, and you procrastinate because you have anxiety. Some of you procrastinate because you're scared of failure. Some of you procrastinate because you're, you're fearful of negative feedback what someone's going to say about what you created or what you did or what you feel you're called to or laugh at you or something like that. You put it off. You procrastinate sometimes because you're depressed and that depression will lead to lack of energy. And then number 10, I think it is, you like sensation seeking. You like it to be done. I like that. I'm not good at projects. I just want it done. I want it done quickly. I don't even care if it's done good. I just want it done. Okay? Sensation thing. You, you like that. There is all these things that go on into your personality when you postpone and when you procrastinate. Felix is the master. This governor is the master of procrastination. He, we're going to read about him. He is going to do this over and over again. Your, your question today is what are you postponing or procrastinating, procrastinating about today? And pray about what it is that's crippling you. Depression, anxiety, failure, failure of failure, um, blind to your future self that, you know, you, you, you're not going to address that. Many people have a really hard time making out their wills, you know, their property wills. You know, I'm blind to that. That's not going to happen to me. Procrastinating. We need to get that done some year. Get it done now. Seriously, you don't know when life changes. Do it now. Write it out now. Tomorrow is a tool 
Satan uses. And this is what he's going to feed into Felix. Satan is going to feed into them, postponing everything. A matter of will and motivation. But worry and anxiety can cripple that in your life. So here it says, Felix heard these things. Having more accurate knowledge of the way, not the sect of the Nazarenes like they said, but he's heard of the way before. His wife is Jewish and adjourned the proceedings. The proceedings. And he said, when Lystra comes, the commander comes down, I will make a decision about your case. Minyana, I'll do it tomorrow. And so he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty. He's at house arrest. He has to stay around there, but he's not in barracks. And told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for him or to come visit him. He just has to stay there in Caesarea by the sea in the, in the compound that they have him in. But he can wander around. He can have company. It's, it's like our house arrest today. And this is what he said to him. I'll come and I'll figure it out later. Do you know why Felix is doing this? Because there's a lot of junk in his heart going on. Some of the stuff that I just mentioned to you, the disconnect from the future self, feeling overwhelmed, anxiety, feel of failure, making a mistake. He has all that happening, and he is not going to make a mistake. He is going to wait. He's going to procrastinate. He's going to postpone and deal with Paul later. And in the meantime, God's still going to use Paul. And so it says here, verse 24, And after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul to hear him concerning the faith. Drusilla, that's a beautiful name, isn't it? She's very beautiful. Her name means beauty, fruitfulness, dewy-eyed. Just big eyes. She just, she's just beautiful. But this girl has a dysfunctional family. This is the daughter of Herod of Agrippa, of royalty. All right? Dysfunctional. Her father, now keep in mind, daddy was the grandson of Herod the Great. And that was the one that ordered all the baby Jew boys to be killed. Remember? Remember? And that is in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. She was first married off at 14. Beautiful women back then were married young. Then old Felix, the fox, he seduced her. And then he took her for his wife. She was Felix's third wife. And she's probably about 19 years old now. She comes from a long line of evil. Drusilla does. Her dad was evil. Her grandpa is evil. She's married two evil men. This is how she is. And for some reason, maybe there was nothing going on great at the cinema that night for Felix to watch. Maybe he was like out of actors to come forward. He decided, let's entertain ourselves with this guy named Paul. Or was it Drusilla's idea? She's Jewish. Maybe she wanted to hear what he had to say. Maybe she was going, you know, he's Jewish, my people, bring him forth. Let's say maybe that's what happened here. And so it was, he was sent for Paul and heard of him because he had had his faith in Christ. And now he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment. Those would not have been the three topics I would have come to Felix about. He just calls him out. First of all, he's going to talk to him about righteousness. Wow. This evil guy that kills the Jews, that is immoral and is cruel. Then he's going to go in and address what? Self-control. Because this guy's out of control as he sits there with his teenage wife. Really? If you got called to give your case, do you think you would be looking at that going, and you, I'm going to talk to you about self-control because you have none. Let me talk to you a little bit about this. And then he said, he talks about judgment. Oh my gosh. 
And here's Felix going, why didn't we call him? What was I thinking? He's talking to me about Jesus. He's saying I have no self-control. He's, he's telling me I'm a procrastinator, that I'm an adulterer, that I'm someone that goes after teenagers. He's like calling me out. And then he says I'm going to get judged for it. Now, if I was Paul, I came up with this. I had to do some serious thinking, but this is what I would have said. First, I would have talked on the pride of the Jews. I would have gone before him and said, you know, they're arrogant, blah, 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 and, this, that, and, this, and they, they criticize me for what I do. And then I would have talked about all the pain I have suffered. I have been shipwrecked. I have been beat. I have been starving. I have been falsely accused. I've been in courts. I've been flogged. I've been all these different things. I would have talked about that. And then I would talk about the injustice of everything people had done to me and the recent beating because I was a Jew and that was unlawful for, a, a, I was a Roman and that's unlawful for a Roman to beat a Roman, but that just happened to me. I would not have talked about righteousness, self-control, and judgment. So what is this? This is what being led of the Spirit looks like. He's the vessel and the words come out. And girls, that's what you are. You're the vessel, and the Holy Spirit comes out when you're that willing vessel. And you just say it. It just comes upon you. I'm sure in the back of his mind, Paul's going, he's going to kill me now. Oh, wait, I have something else to say. Self-control. You have no self-control. You're a procrastinator. You're an adulterer. You, are, you have a 19-year-old wife. You know, the, the, you're, you're wretched. And he's looking at his wife, too, and she's going, you're wretched. You're all just wretched, and you will pay. There is a judgment day. And he's probably going, shut up. Why are you saying these things? Be quiet. And he's looking at him. He reasoned about righteousness. Have that underlined. Have this whole verse underlined. He reasoned about righteousness calling out the self-control, told him of the judgment that was coming. Felix was afraid and said, go away for now, and I'll call for you later at a more convenient time, postponing the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I'll accept Jesus later. I'll get back with the Lord off of my, my binge backsliding in a few more years, and then I'll, I'll get really serious with God. Tomorrow is a tool of the devil, because Jesus said, today is the day of salvation. I'll get back with you tomorrow, because he has no self-will. He's a procrastinator. He puts things off. He, he postpones the problem. And girls, we need to face the problems and give them to God. We need to face them head on and say, Lord, this is your problem because it's in my life and you love me. And he goes, okay, let's work on that. Let me help you with that. Meanwhile, he had hope for money. Felix was hoping that maybe in the meantime he'd get a bribe from him. That didn't happen. After two years, Festus is going to come and succeed him. Felix, Felix is going out of power. And Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor that complimented him, because it's much better to hear how good you are than how nasty you are, he left Paul in jail for two more years. And what do you think Paul was doing in there? Witnessing, talking to people about the Lord, because the Lord called him aside now for a while to sit instead of being so busy to be stationary for a while but to find joy, to find joy in your quarantine, right? When we go through these things, we find joy in that. We look to see who we can reach out to, who we can call, who we can text. When God calls us in, it's not to just make you despair, but it's to actually give out more to those that are around us. Paul had to go back to jail for two more years for just mere words he spoke for no reason. But he gladly defended himself, and he spoke the truth. Heavenly Father, let us be these women that can speak truth, Father, that we just don't flatter because we want everyone to like us, but that, Lord, we would be, um, we would be honest 
And Lord Jesus, that you would give us, Father, the words to say to people to encourage and uplift and bring them back into the fold. Lord Jesus, that we would have that, um, that heart of yours that goes after that one lost sheep, Lord. And Father, that we would be a women of principle. And Father, that we would not put things off. Lord, that we would that we would control our self-will, Lord, that we were going to go ahead and go forward and finish what we started, Lord, that we don't procrastinate, we don't postpone. But more than that, Lord, we don't want to procrastinate or postpone anything you're trying to tell us this morning about ourselves. And Lord, as we discuss this one-on-one, -on -one, why we feel we're doing these things, Lord, we just pray, God, that there would be a healing in that and that, Lord Jesus, we would be motivated and, Lord, that we would be those people, Father, that go forward for your kingdom with nothing holding us back. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. amen.